Uh, awesome. So, so what, are, what am I here to, to talk about tonight? Um, well, obviously, you've all come down to Clover Health to talk a bit about you know, doing data science in healthcare. Uh, sort of a brief overview of what we're gonna, what I'm gonna tell you about is, you know, we'll give you another sort of introduction to Clover, talk about the healthcare space in general, some of the you know, rules and regulations we deal with, and then, of course, uh, the ways that data science can help healthcare and the ways that we can really do some sort of like powerful analysis on there. Um, I, I know you just got a brief sort of introduction to, to myself earlier, but, and, and Clover as a whole, but first we're gonna go over that. So once again, uh, just who am I? Uh, this life-size picture actually might be fairly close at this time. Um, is the basic summary of who I am. Uh, before this, I was originally in academia where I was studying operations research at UC Berkeley. Uh, I spent a good amount of time there before I decided I really wanted to focus on sort of the practical applications of the theory that we'd been, been working on in that. Uh, I found the best way to do that was to teach myself to program. So I left grad school for a while, uh, really focused on sort of Python and open source programming, taking you know, use of all the, the many sort of like free options that we have uh, in sort of the modern world. And then uh, I bounced around for a while in venture capital analytics, which is a horribly unstructured problem. Uh, surprisingly, given how much money people throw around in venture capital, there's like no real reliable data source. So as Ian mentioned, I got really addicted to horrible data, and so I jumped over to healthcare. Uh, and obviously, the most important part of or thing about me right now is that I work here. Um, usually, uh, I just point at this and say that I work here at this billboard, but I actually do work in this building right now, which is a really cool experience here. Um, so, so what, what is Clover Health? Again, well, we are far more than a billboard over New Jersey. Uh, we are currently a, a Medicare Advantage company. So it is a private health insurance plan for people on Medicare, which is generally people who are 65 years of age or older. Uh, we currently operate in nine counties of New Jersey, and we have you know, about 18,000 members across those counties. So just before we go any further, just to sort of establish you know, how like, the health insurance uh, scheme sort of works here, right? Uh, in, in traditional health insurance, you, you have you know, a payer, which is the insurer, which would be us. You have a patient and a provider. The patient will pay you know, premiums to their, their insurance company. They will also pay small you know, amounts to, to their doctor's office themselves. And then we will ultimately pay you know, the, the provider much of the, the share of, you know, for their, their services and for their claims. Um, but how does that work in Medicare Advantage? So the difference in Medicare Advantage is that now Instead of the member paying premiums to us, almost everything is covered by the government, which subsidizes us based off of what they believe to be sort of the risk profile of each of our members. You know, how, uh, what have they been diagnosed with or treated for in the past year? And then how much do they expect that person to cost to like a health insurance plan for you know, all of their services that they would incur over the next sort of year? Uh, generally, the, the, like the paradigms in health insurance for how to profit, right, is you either you know, risk pooling where you just insure as many people as possible that are sort of low cost and you, you profit off of the like small probabilities of these really rare events or the other option is to just deny claims. You just refuse to pay for things, right? Save plenty of money that way. Uh, but we here at Clover, sort of the difference is, you know, naturally it's not a unique proposition to be a health insurance plan for Medicare, right? So what is our sort of difference here? Well, we have this, our thesis is that, you know, we get basically a fixed subsidy for each of these members uh, throughout the year uh, for what they think that they're going to cost. But then we believe that by actually using, you know, building a really efficient insurance company and automating a lot of our processes and using preventive measures, predictive analytics, that we can actually go in and identify you know, care gaps, identify new diseases before they manifest in these really acutely expensive hospitalizations. We can go in, we can identify those, and then by proactively treating things, we can actually change sort of the underlying risk probabilities. You know, we can change what we think members are going to actually sort of cost during the year. And you know, when I say modifying risk probabilities, that sounds all fun and mathy, but like, what is the real implication of that is that we're actually you know, improving health outcomes for our members. We are trying to profit directly by you know, giving them a healthier experience, by keeping them you know, healthy, keeping them out of the hospital, keeping them from really acutely expensive hospitalizations. And then ultimately that you know, sort of leads to, to how we profit. Now, in sort of the general sphere of data science, right? This seems fairly straightforward. You probably have a lot of probabilities of these things. You can you know, measure what your members have done, apply some really complicated models, and just spit out answers, right? That would be nice. But we are in healthcare, right? And healthcare is heavily regulated and tremendously complex. I am going to bark this at you multiple times, including on this next slide. Healthcare is heavily regulated and tremendously complex. Um, 
It's a crazy industry. And so, so what do I mean by this? Well, first of all, you know, heavily regulated, right? Uh, with our data, we have tons and tons of restrictions that general in their sort of current iteration were handed down by HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. HIPAA is a, a well-intentioned piece of legislation that is supposed to keep, you know, protect our, our members from having all of their personal information leaked into you know, the public sphere, especially with the, the current state of technology. Now, HIPAA is also an endless source of acronyms, uh, sort of the the, the crux of it here is that you know, HIPAA is run or administered by the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, if we want to share our data with any other companies, we have to sign a very strictly negotiated business associate agreement. Uh, all this protects us from leaking personal health information or personally identifiable information about our, you know, our members or any of their illnesses or anything that could be used to essentially cause harm to, to them. And uh, then within the Medicare sphere itself, you know, we deal primarily with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. There are also a million other acronyms, but sort of the crux of it is that anything that we do here not only has to be documented, but it has to be defensible, right? Uh, it, it goes well beyond any of the normal sort of like software practices where it's like, oh, you need some documentation so that we could redo this or so other people can understand sort of what you're working on. So everything that we do, it has to be just meticulously documented because we could be audited at any time to make sure that we are acting in sort of like the best interest of our members. And so if we are audited and it finds out that we are not, uh, we can get charged a lot of money and have to pay a lot to a lot of people. Now, how much do we have to pay? Well, I'm really glad you asked that, Otis. Uh, HIPAA itself can, uh, looking at just the maximum sort of fines on this, can charge you up to $50,000 per violation with an annual maximum of one and a half million dollars in one year. That is more than a fine or a, a slap on the wrist, right? That is like a whole funding round for a company. If, if, if you are caught, you know, just mishandling sort of like your, your user data or leaking anything about your, your members or just being willfully sort of ignorant of these sorts of things. Now, as I mentioned, healthcare is also tremendously complex. So sort of the other, the other side, the other difficulty to this industry, right, is that there are so many you know, different payers that can come up for everything. There's so many different rules, so many reg regulations, everything that we just have to deal with. Um, back in the 90s, uh, it became a thing to attack healthcare. Uh, this is Arlen Specter currently attacking healthcare in this photo, and so the way to do that was you take everything in healthcare and you try to fit it on a board. Now, you probably try to fit it on a large board, but you're still obviously going to fail because healthcare does not fit on a board. But to attack it, you try to do that, and then you take this board with you and you lug it around. You lug it around Washington, D.C., you take it everywhere and say, look, healthcare is insanely complex. I can't do this. Now, people still try to put healthcare on boards today. Somehow, this is still an effective way to attack it. But just for a sort of an illustration here, yeah, this is like a list of just a few of the other payers that can come up. So, you know, if somebody has a claim, like went to a doctor for this service, should be straightforward. Oh, we pay, you know, this much. But it can come down to, you know, Medicaid, other payers, states. You can have multiple types of insurance. You know, you can have other catastrophic plans. All sorts of different things can factor into this. Now, considering, you know, healthcare being heavily regulated and tremendously complex, uh, are you still on board for, for, for moving forward with us? You're all still here, so I'm going to say yes. Awesome. Uh, my next sort of thing to talk about then, uh, when I say, you know, health insurance uh, technology or health insurance tech stacks, or what, what do you, you picture? Because I, I bet it's this. Uh, yeah, this is, you know, surprisingly not far off for a lot of health insurance companies right now. Uh, there is still COBOL floating around in a lot of databases, if, if you are familiar with that amazing language. But, uh, Thankfully, sort of the difference with, with Clover is that you know, we are a little bit more tech forward. So what does our tech stack actually look like? Um, as I mentioned before, any you know, company that wants to sort of, that would have to hold our data, we have to sign a very strict agreement with. So it sort of limits the, the number of people that we can actually interact with. But you know, we, we end up using a fairly good mix of you know, open source tools and then you know, some private services. So what are these tools? You know, like our databases are, are in Postgres. You know, we, our repos are mostly in Python here. Uh, our engineering team will work a lot in React. Uh, we do a lot with, with Docker. Um, some of the services that we actually do work with, we do a lot of our uh, like sort of reporting in, within the company uh, through our, our lovely compatriots, Mode Analytics, who will be speaking to you shortly after me. Um, we store most of our databases on sort of a very private server, which is run through, through Aptable. We also store a lot of things in Amazon. And then naturally, our, our sort of like our Python repos, our SQL repos, all of that will live within GitHub. It's in the organization. 
So, so given that sort of tech stack, like where does data science sort of fit? Now, this is very much the long form answer to where does data science fit in the organization. Don't stare too much at this chart. But what you should really take from it is that you know, as, as a data science team here, uh, our responsibility is basically to you know, take uh, healthcare data from a lot of different sources, you know, the, you know, pharmacies, providers, uh, labs, uh, hospitals, all sorts of different things, to take all of that, uh, all of this very often like, conflicting information, and from there, you know, we have to distill the real people that you know, underlie all this health data. We have to distill their actual diseases that they have and the diseases that we think they might have. We, we process all of this. You know, we send it out to like, our operations team. And this gives us feedback that we have to keep processing and you know, keep moving forward with reporting. Now, obviously, there's a lot of like, engineering or product functions that will come within that or operational functions. So what does is, what is data science really boil down to? Um, as, as illustrated by this lovely black box, there are about five things that, that we really do here. Um, we, we, we count things, we clean things, we automate things, we mine things, and we predict things. Um, of course, the, the real question is, that I get from everybody on this is, is count things? Like, really? Do, do you need a team of 15 people with graduate degrees to count things? And the answer is yes. The answer is absolutely yes. Because counting is really hard. <laughs> counting is absurdly hard. Um, Sort of, it's, it's a symptom, right, of when you take these really complex real world scenarios and you try to fit it into a nice, sort of like simple data model that you can hand around to like track, oh, your member's health. Now, it's really nice if it fits into your specific data model and it doesn't change, but if you get a whole bunch of these data models together, they start arguing with each other, and before you know it, you can't find your way out. You are deep in a labyrinth and, and your members are somewhere on the other side. Um, but maybe it's probably easier if I just show you sort of why, why counting is hard. Right? Uh, so first off, we'll count something really simple. Uh, we will just count employees. Um, so our, these are the, num the employee counts on LinkedIn of us and sort of our three sort of like major competitors. Um, now, as you'll notice, we are much smaller than, than the other ones here. Um, with these really complex scenarios, of course, you, one way to do it would just be to count on your fingers, and they have hundreds of thousands more fingers than we do, um, but, but with our you know, sort of like 200 employees, we have to be very like, smart about the way that we actually try to count things in the healthcare. Um, but let's get into an actual real example. So let's try to just count people. Let's, let's count our members. Uh, what's like, the first thing you would want to do if you were building a health insurance plan? You'd probably want an ID number for, for all of your members. That, that sounds straightforward, right? Just give everyone a unique ID. Well, of course, in healthcare, these IDs are not unique. Uh, they, they never were. The, even the system for them for how you create this number is not unique at all. Uh, Medicare IDs sort of like arose when they're like, oh, we'll just combine you know, social security numbers with railroad retirement board numbers. That'd be nice and easy. It ends up with multiple different formats. There's even a third format as the railroad retirement board decided it was getting kind of dated and wanted to sort of update itself. Um, but, but how does this sort of manifest itself? And what are the real problems with this? Well, let's just study the, the social security number here. Uh, the, in general, most of our members We'll have a, a HICN, which is their health insurance claim number, sort of their, their main identifier here, which is a social security number and a letter. Now notice I said a social security number. It is not necessarily your social security number. Uh, because while being you know, 65 can make you or can qualify you for Medicare, you may actually have your eligibility if you haven't had you know, a sufficient number or a sufficient amount of work experience with like, a Medicare eligible company, your eligibility may actually come through someone else. So, Say you're 65 and you haven't worked in, in a, for enough years to be actually eligible, but say your, your partner is. So now uh, you, you are on Medicare, congratulations, but your identifier is their social security number plus a letter that says that you're their wife or you're their second wife or you're their divorced wife or you're their child who is also on here. Uh, re like really, there, there are more of these. If you ever want to just entertain yourself, you can look up these like Hicken suffixes or suffixes. Uh, they, they get really interesting. There's, there's one for being somebody's alleged second father, which is, uh, I, I can't really explain that one to you. Um, but so, sort of some like illustrative examples of this, right? And uh, these are things pulled actively from our database, of course. I've changed their numbers because I, I don't want to just do a live demo of you know, a HIPAA violation for all of you. Uh, but you know, like this first case here, this is one person who you know, eventually ends up being, you know, the A sort of denotes that it's their social security number. This is them. 
But you know, at one point, they were you know, somebody else's spouse. And before that, they were also eligible on another one. Um, we have another case here where you know, we have three members who it's all using one social security number. And then you know, case, case three down here, right? It, it's, you know, it's three different people with four different social security, or four different identifiers, but you know, one social security number sort of tying them all together. Um, it, it's one thing, you know, if we actually see this, if we can actually track somebody when they come through and we can watch these changing so we can tie them together. But the fun thing is, if this person joins with, with this number here, and then they leave, and their number changes, and then their number changes again, and then they come back, we don't get the middle number. It, it doesn't appear. We just get the, the start and the end, and we just have to find way back into there. Uh, but, but enough about people themselves. Let's, let's count another fun situation in healthcare. Let's count just providers. Let's count doctors. So what, what happens when you go to a doctor, right? You, you see one person in one building, uh, and then you pay, we pay that one building and you know, it eventually gets back to the doctor, right? Because that, that's how this stuff always works. What's the real scenario look like when you say go to a hospital for a service? It looks a little bit more like this. You have about four doctors who, who you know, may all be at one hospital, but may also belong to a physician's practice or a physician like collective. Uh, you think you're seeing just Dr. Bob, but your results pass around. It goes to these doctors all over here. We are supposed to find you know, the NPI, which is like the doctor's identifier. We're supposed to find who you actually visited. But the problem is, who do we pay? Oh, you'd assume the hospital has one tax ID. No, the hospital may have you know, several different tax IDs, one for each wing. Plus, the hospital can have its own doctor IDs, because in healthcare, hospitals can be people. And in that case, who do you pay? That, that is one of the things that is a, a lot of fun to sort of count in healthcare. But, you know, maybe at this point we shouldn't focus anymore so on like sort of counting. A lot of the data science needs that we've done, had at Clover have just been very sort of reactive. It's been sort of things that we absolutely have to do, like finding our members and finding their doctors and figuring out who to pay. But sort of one of the more exciting things, as we've sort of done this for a while and we slowly get more and more on top of our data, right, we've had these opportunities to do sort of more sort of like proactive measures, to do some really sort of interesting applications of, of like data science principles and use some more sort of complicated models. Now, uh, to preface this, one thing uh, in healthcare, just given the fact that you know, everything is so tremendously complex, you'd be amazed just how much like even a small or a simple sort of statistical model, uh, just how much of an impact that, that can have on something in healthcare. Um, let me show you a few sort of examples of this and uh, sort of things that we've done here at Clover. Um, so first, sort of a, a case study. Here, um, open enrollment is the one time of year when we can actually like, actively grab sort of members. Uh, interestingly, there are only two months where we can uh, sign up like 95% of people on Medicare to our plan. It is crunch time is you know, mid-October, mid -October, great month, mid-October to early December. Uh, yeah, it all blurs together to October. Uh, so one, last year uh, in our open enrollment, uh, we, we had found that you know, for all of our marketing initiatives, we were storing all of our leads in Salesforce. There have been like 15,000 of those, right? But you know, meanwhile, when somebody actually enrolls, we get a, you know, an enrollment that has to go through, through Medicare, which is like a really like, rich data set. But the problem is, you know, it, it isn't enough to know just how many leads like a marketing initiative has sort of generated. That doesn't tell us anything, right? What we really want to know is how effective things have actually been at generating members. So ideally, all of these leads would be directly connected to their enrollments, right? Well, of course, they, they were not. So, so how, do you, how do you sort of deal with that, right? Uh, you, you can go through it by hand and try to match 15,000 people to 7,000 other people, but something tells me that's not going to work out. Or if it does, you're go about to lose, you know, like several weeks of your life trying to sort of connect these things. So uh, we, we passed it around on the team. We were wondering sort of like what could we do to actually find this? Um, so here's, here's what we came up with. As it turned out, uh, we actually, somebody had manually connected this stuff for 2014. So we had been able to sort of see you know, like how this might actually work. Um, we, we found you know, within Salesforce, which is all you know, a hand entered and is a lot of low quality. We'll, we'll just call it low quality data, right? Uh, we found that even though you know, it came with like 80 different columns of things that we could use, there were only maybe five of these that actually had reliable values for everything. Now, thankfully, for our enrollment data, because that had to pass through Medicare, it was like very, you know, very meticulously examined. You know, it was rich. All the fields in there were sort of good. So anything that we could find in there that would maybe map to one of these five columns might actually be useful. Uh, so what did we end up doing? Um, 
So it turns out that if you just looked at, say, like the, the edit distance, the Levenstein distance between you know, the first name in an enrollment, the first name in a lead, last name in an enrollment, last name in a lead, uh, the city name on an actual enrollment form, the city name on the lead, and then just check, OK, maybe is there an, an like, exact match on phone number or an exact match on zip code, that you could run that. And, and just by throwing this you know, into a, a simple logistic regression model, right, you could get really high call or really high precision which is a very, very low threshold. You, know, um, you can get up to, for, yeah, guessing on like 35% of your leads, you know, if, if it generates a lead, it's right like 95% of the time, which is amazing. And instead of having somebody go through this and do everything by hand for many, many hours, we sort of wrote this in like one day and then just ran overnight. And you know, the next day it came back and we could actually look at this sort of stuff. And we could see you know, uh, how many enrollments all of our different sort of levers had, had generated for us. Um, what is, you know, what, let's look at another sort of interesting like, case study here. Uh, let's talk about pending claims, right? So uh, when somebody gets a service, right, or has a service done and you know, their doctor wants to be paid for it, right, they submit a claim to us. But claims won't always be sort of processed immediately, right? A, a lot of times they will sit in sort of this pending state. Or this, uh, yeah, just sort of on end for a while. So as a health insurance company, though, it, it is very important for us to know how much, you know, all of the claims that are currently sitting in pen, that are s sitting in this sort of, you know, limbo right now, how much those may eventually cost us, right? Because we need to know how much money to actually reserve on the side. Um, now, the, sort of the, the standard way to do this, actually, is, is you look at, you know, all of your claims, uh, all of your pending claims and how much they ended up costing for sort of like the past year. And you assume that, okay, the process isn't going to change. We just look at this sort of like month over month over month. Uh, but of course, that assumes like operational stability. That assumes that you are doing like, the same thing this whole time. Now, naturally, we are a startup, and things are changing all the time. And to assume that you know our, our operational procedures now are the same as they were a year ago is absolute madness. Right? Two years ago, we didn't even have a tech office here, and, and everything has been changing. We've been growing like like crazy. So we figured you know we, this sort of estimation method wasn't working great for us. So sort of what could we do? How could we possibly sort of get around this? Well, how could we generate more reliable estimates? Well, it, it turns out that actually just by looking at a very sort of like short time window uh, of our claims, if you just look at say like the claims of our past month, or assume that maybe in the past like two months that our operational procedure has been relatively consistent. It's like could we draw sort of a, a random sample from that actual group there and, and generate what we think might be sort of like a prediction for how much of the current claims that we're actually sitting on are going to cost. So uh, we, you know, we looked into this, we explored things for a little while. It turned out that like, our, our pens sort of had this, this bimodal distribution over time. We'd seen where it's like a lot of them will be you know, sort of processed very quickly. Others will sit sort of like two weeks there. So we, we fit a distribution to that, which is you know, like an exponential variable, and sort of like a normal variable there for, to make sort of like a joint probability there. Uh, and you know, given how many days a claim that had been sitting in our sort of like our pending process, we could predict like, was it part of this this early set of claims or was it part of this later set of claims? And just using a very sort of simple like weighted average of these probabilities and you know random draws, it, it found out that like just using this past month, we could get within you know like five percent of what our pending claims actually seem to be sort of costing. Now, naturally, there's a lot more testing to do on this, and I can't show you the actual numbers for things because I'm not going to. I am withholding that from you. But it, it, just the amazing fact was, you know, just by giving you this, this like simple sort of probabilistic distribution here that we could actually generate fairly accurate measures of claims using a very short retrospective time window that would hopefully be a lot more robust to operational procedures. Now, one last sort of case study here for you, and this is like the, the quintessential question that we get sort of here. Right, it's like given you know every like medications, calls, labs, everything that a member has been through. Like, can we actually predict sort of their their afflictions or diseases that they, they may sort of had? So we took some time here and we you know assembled a bunch of our features and we sort of ran some numbers here to to see what this if we could actually sort of predict this predict this. Now these are ROC curves here, uh, trying to predict whether a member has you know diabetes or angina. Um, now. Fully explaining an ROC curve is a little bit outside of the scope of this talk, but basically what it's looking at is, you know, given two people, one who does have a disease and one who doesn't, how good, can you, how good is any test at predicting which person actually has it and which person doesn't? Uh, this red line here would be sort of like a coin flip, right? So, you know, if you just arbitrarily chose one of these two people, it would end up being like 50% of the time, you know, you'd be right, you'd be wrong, and it wouldn't really have any sort of predictive value. But like, 
if you were running a very reliable test here, right, you would be able to get a whole bunch of true positives without getting any false positives at all. You would almost always be able to pick you know, the, the person who actually does have the disease. And so we found that by just like testing on some of our lab data and a whole bunch of other information that we had about our members and like our current set, right, that we can get almost up to this left corner. Now, the, the ideal test right, is always right and always gives you a true positive and never gives you a false positive and gets you up to there. But you know, we found that just looking through like fairly simple, you know, fairly simple collections of features about each of our members that we could actually get you know, fairly close there, at least for diabetes, which is really exciting. And you know, this is something that, of course, we are, we are going to be refining for the entire time that we are a company here, right? because it drives all sorts of different powerful analyses that we can do. Um, from there, uh, so, so sort of like where to from here. Um, so you know, I, I showed you some of like the, the, difficult, the difficulties that we have in healthcare dealing with regulations and you know, dealing with uh, just the tremendous complexity of sort of the industry, you know, I showed you like a lot of the difficulties we have with just counting things, how hard it is to find people, and you know, sort of some of the more proactive or the the cooler sort of data science applications, and just how effective simple models can be, you know, in, in a space here that is very like for a very long time been traditionally just sort of like outdated, right? Uh, that's something that we're really trying to change. So, you know, going forward with 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 Clover, uh, we're we're finding that you know the more that we learn about health insurance, the more that we realize that we don't know, right? We are very much trying to explore this industry basically for the first time as a tech company. And you know, we're trying to be a data-driven healthcare company that like everything we do, we're trying to learn as much as we can to drive sort of our, our motions you know, for, for the future. And yeah, the, the more that we actually discover, the more we realize we don't know. And to some people, you know, that could be very daunting as you realize that once you finally feel like you're on top of one tiny sliver of healthcare, that you have this entire you know, vast space ahead of you. Uh, when I think of it, it always reminds me of this picture, right? that you know, we, we are some very, very tiny dot who feels kind of accomplished, but then realizes the scope of the universe. Um, it, it can be really intimidating to some people, but I actually think it's, uh, it's pretty cool, and it, it's what keeps me in healthcare. So uh, on that note, uh, that is all I had for you today. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, so the question was, you know, that we are trying to, our business model is trying to like minimize sort of acute illnesses or so to, to minimize cost, and what are we trying to minimize here? Um, so, so really what we're trying to minimize, right, is just anything, we're, we're trying to minimize the amount of times that somebody develops a disease, right, any disease, and it manifests itself in an acute, sort of like a hospitalization, just a rare event, something that is gonna happen one time and is going to be like absurdly expensive in relation to if we were able to just catch it beforehand. Um, Frankly, this, this ends up being, you know, all sorts of different illnesses. Uh, kind of the, the main example, right, is, is diabetes. Because, you know, diabetes is the one that affects more of our population than anybody else, yeah, or than anything else, right? And it, we, we've very recently been, you know, operating a lot on trying to predict which of our members that have diabetes now are, are about to develop, you know, like complications, or are most likely to develop some much more aggressive form of diabetes, or another disease related to that. And so that would be sort of like our main example, but really it comes down to just everything that our members have. Right, right. So it wouldn't be about acute illnesses. It would just be about, you know, like really expensive hospitalizations. Because, right? you know, that shouldn't be you know, part of the routine for anybody, right? Yeah, so, so asking sort of what more predictive data you know, about diabetes leads to, or we believe leads to sort of complications. Uh, so I, I haven't dealt too much with the diabetes by, myself. Um, uh, as Ian mentioned before, there are you know, 12 other people roaming around on like, the data science team here who uh, I'm sure would be more willing to, or more able to answer that sort of for you. But you know, just w within like sort of the, the feature graph that we were generating before, right? We were, just combining you know, everything that we can about a member, just 
from all sorts of different illnesses, from all of their lab data, from all of their, you know, uh, everything we get from providers. Talk a lot about trying to unify timeline Mm -hmm. that have, what fraction of your patients, as best as you can guess, are actually split up and appear to be different IDs in the raw data? Yeah, so, so what you know, fraction of our people, um, of our, our current members, may be like split up and may be represented as multiple people in our data? Uh, sort of the last time I, I looked at this, we, we had seen like 22,000 22, people that had interacted with our system. We'd seen like 23,000 or 23,000 Hickens that had come through. So, you know, sort of like upper bounding that there. Right, that, yeah, it, it's roughly like, 10%. yeah, one, one in like 10 people may have another ID in our system. So it's very important for us to actually, you know, find the, the unifying step there, be able to tie them together. And how, how much is that gonna affect your predictive models? Do you predict them? Have you guys run it on, like, screw it, everybody's different, no, they're actually not, we don't care. Um, how bad does your model do? Uh, so I can't say what the results are when we just throw out at really bad data. Uh, well, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> It'd be really, yeah. Yeah, so, so like uh, as I'd, just to sort of reiterate there, so like as I'd mentioned, you know, we've spent a very long time just making sure that we have sort of like the truth in our data, being on top of our data warehouse here. And that's why, you know, we, we didn't really start doing a lot of really crazy predictive measures. You know, it, it's just stuff that's ev developed over time as we've slowly had opportunities to really expand our analysis. So we've seen a lot of the electronic medical data companies come up in the past couple of years. In general, from the insurance perspective, mm -hmm. Yeah, so so the question was, you know, looking at you know, like all the different medical systems, or what is the lag time for, for getting members? Uh, it varies is probably the best answer. It can be really low if the doctor integrates. Otis says it can be really low if the if a doctor integrates. What is low OB? It could be like you could do a real time For, for the recording there, Otis says it could take a lifetime to <laughs> get your member data in real time. Um, all right, uh, on that note, uh, I am currently out of time. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, I will pass this back to you.